Welcome to the Startup Grind. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks, Lisa. All right, so I'm not sure my microphone's working, so we're, we're speaking up. Are we all good? <laughs> yep, okay. The video is fine, I'm not sure about the audio one. Okay. But. All right, so as I just mentioned, you got into business early. School Tuck Shop was the first entry. Tell yeah. us about how that came about and what you kind of did from, I suppose, the next one, which was also while you were at school. Yeah, so um, I'm from South Africa. That's where I went to school and, and grew up. I moved to Brisbane in about 2001. Um, but yeah, I was at boarding school in South Africa and the school wanted to close down the school tuck shop because it wasn't doing very well. Um, and so I came up with a proposal to the school that I was, would run the school tuck shop. I was living there anyway, so why didn't <laughs> I run it? Um, so ultimately, uh, I ended up taking over the school tuck shop. And obviously being a student running the tuck shop was a bit, a bit of a novelty. So all my mates, popular. Um, yeah, I suddenly became really, really popular overnight and the school tuck shop became a real success story. And at the end of leaving the school to move to Australia, I ended up selling uh, the tuck shop for a fairly good profit. So that was my first, I guess, proper business. You and you could sold say. that back to the school, did you? Sold that back to the school, yeah. Um, and I, as I understand it, the school tuck shop still runs today. So I guess we, uh, yeah, we turned that around. It was it was pretty exciting. I had all my mates working for me, and um, it was great. Awesome. And we did some pretty dodgy things. Um, yeah, lots of pies that probably shouldn't have been <laughs> fed to poor unknowing students. Not checking the students. temperature so yeah, much. Yeah, not checking the, the, the temperature. Definitely nothing. You could never do it in Australia, obviously. Uh, but in but in South Africa, it was all right. Uh, yeah. So another business that I had at school, I was. Um, I'm an avid fly fisherman. I don't know if anyone else fly fishes here, but I, I love fly fishing. And I used to fly, uh, tie my own flies and um, we had a piscatorial society at school. And so I started an online store um, on the internal network at school selling um, flies to other school uh, members, including teachers. And um, ultimately that became too big for the school and then it became a public website. And I guess that was my first proper e-commerce store. My parents were also uh, in the inkjet cartridge business, uh, selling inkjet cartridges as wholesalers. Um, so my next online store was actually a, a printer consumables store, selling printer consumables online. Still um, in South Africa then? Still in South Africa, yeah. Yep. Um, and yeah, I guess those, those are my first real businesses. Before mm -hmm. that, I think I did what every entrepreneur does. I sold rubbish bags to my neighbors <laughs> and um, all of that. But yeah, those were the, the, the first, I guess, startups that I so involved in. what do you think created the entrepreneurial drive so early for you? Was there, like, uh, you know, can, where did that come from? It's a really good question because neither of my parents, um, I, I think you could say, were or are, you know, traditional entrepreneurs. Um, you know, my father worked and was the director for Canon, so a very large, you know, multinational organisation. Um, and my mum was, um, you know, she's always worked for banks and, you know, other large organisations. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, um, my father retired really early and, and since he retired, he actually did uh, buy into other businesses and um, I guess he does have that entrepreneurial spirit. He's never really had his own startup as such. Um, so I would say it's probably from the father's side of the business. Um, yeah. His father was a, a merchant trader in Ireland. Um, so yeah, I'd say it's probably so from it's there. hereditary somewhere in there. Yeah, it's So there. did you ever have a job working for someone else? Um, yes, once. <laughs> um, it was in Australia when I was at school still. Um, it was for Leonard's Chicken. It was the worst <laughs> job ever. I shouldn't say that on camera. Um, but it was terrible. And my job was actually, because it was after school. And when I came to South Africa, I was a year older than everyone, so I could drive. And so I was able to drive myself from school to, you know, the late shift at Carindale, Lynn's Chicken. <laughs> and my job was literally emptying the carcasses mm -hmm. into the big bin at the back of the Westfield shopping center. Great. And often I didn't quite balance that wheelie bin <laughs> on the, uh, yeah, it was horrible. And so I, I guess that <laughs> made me never, never work for anyone else again. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. So tell us about your, what happened when you got to Australia? What was your first business that you did here? Um, so yeah, like I said, my parents have always been in the office consumable space with my dad being in Canon and they bought a company um, over here called Ausjet, which is a wholesaler of printer consumables. 
Um, and so the first business that I had here was an online store selling printed consumables, obviously leveraging my parents mm. um, and the relationship that I have there, um, using them as a, a supplier ultimately, yeah. using their warehouse facilities, etc. So that was the first um, online business that I did have here. Um, and that, how did you fund yeah. that and get that started? Like, um, Yeah, I mean, that was self-funded. The beauty of being able to develop my own online store myself, I didn't have to pay a developer mm. to build the store. So it was literally just hosting, you know, paying for hosting costs. And I think I hosted those stores with like iPowerWeb in the US for, you know, 20 bucks a month yeah. or something at the time. So the startup costs were very, very, very low. And I guess, you know, a decade ago um, or more now, 16 years ago really we're talking about, the cost uh, to market through channels like Google AdWords, etc., was really, really low. No, I mean, yeah. we got, you know, four cents a click um, and fairly there good wasn't conversion much rates. There wasn't, there was, there was a... no, there was bugger all competition. So mm -hmm. um, the startup costs were considerably lower than they would be today. Yeah. yeah. So what happened after that? You were doing inkjet? Um, yeah, so, so that sort of evolved to when I went to uni university, I started a a thing called Uni Supplies, and I guess that um, it started with printer consumables, but it extended into other university supplies, I guess. And I partnered with a, I guess you could say, a venture capitalist, if you want, so, or an investor, a, a guy called Carl Jacoby, um, who owned a company that my parents supplied. Um, and he saw, saw something in what I was doing, and he gave me a bit of funding, and we sort of grew Uni Supplies into, you know, I wouldn't say a substantial business, but it was. Um, it was generating cash flow, um, and ultimately I was able to sell that business and fund going uh, to further my studies in France, in Grenoble. So um, yeah, I guess that was where yeah, I started right. in So in what Australia. did you study at uni? Um, so I went to QUT, so I believe they're you know, part of tonight, so that's great. Um, and I actually uh, studied international business at QUT, I and, I, and I, oh you did, yeah, <laughs> um, and, and also marketing. Um, I didn't study anything to do with IT or, or software. Um, I'm sure it's a fantastic course, but I didn't think I'd get. So are you, you know, self-taught in that area? Yeah, I'm self-taught in that skills, area. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I didn't study anything to related, I guess, to really what I'm doing today, other than the business side mm -hmm. of what I'm doing today. Um, but yeah, it was. A, it was. I enjoyed my time at uni. I didn't spend a hell of a lot of time at uni. Um, no, it was by sort the sounds of, of it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I, I went for the exams, and that was about it. Um, but yeah, I think what I really got out of um, going to QT was the opportunity to leverage their relationships with international business schools um, and that's how I was able to go over to France. Right. I went to the Grenoble School of Management and did a postgraduate uh, course there which was really great and I think that was you know probably one of the best things I've ever done. Great. Um, just gave me a, a really uh, great understanding of global business which I think as we move global over the next couple of years it will you know really be of benefit to me. Yeah, yeah. you go oh, I studied that I remember that. Yeah. Now. yeah. <laughs> Perfect and Okay, so when you came back from France, what, what then? Um, so yeah, when I came back to, from France, um, obviously I'd finished uni, it was time to get you know, serious. And at the time, online retail in this country was really starting to take off. So I'm sure a lot of you would have heard of companies like Deals Direct and OO.com today, you and you know, they were really starting to get some, some traction, not you know, necessarily through their own websites at the time, but through eBay specifically. Um, so auction brokers, that was Deals Direct at the time, you know, they were doing really well and I, I saw that and I sort of wanted to replicate what they were doing. Um, so I headed over to China and I sourced um, some product based on some research that I did using a tool at the time, eBay Market Research at the time. Um, and it was a container load of massage chairs was the first product that I brought in. And before the product had even landed in Australia, I'd already pre-sold them all on eBay. So I thought, wow, this is easy. So I went over to China again and um, went to the Canton Fair. I'm sure some of you have heard of that. And if you haven't, it's a really great life experience just to go to the Canton Fair. And it's fairly inexpensive to go there nowadays from Brisbane. There's a direct flight. Um, and I sourced you know, more products. I, we started a brand of bicycles uh, called Odin. We started a brand of air, uh, tools, air tools um, called Kara. Um, and we started adding, I guess, to this inventory. And before we knew it, we had you know, a department store on eBay that was fairly successful. So we, we branched out from just eBay to our own online store that we sort of built ourselves. Um, and before we knew that, you know, we had an online department store, an online department store on eBay. And it was going really well, but for every 100 orders that we were sort of adding uh, to our business each day, we'd have to get another staff member because everything was manual. There's, you know, eBay didn't talk to our website, which didn't talk to our accounting mm -hmm. software, which was MIB at the time and uh, none of that talked to our freight providers. So we were manually keying you know, yeah. into all these different systems. And um, 
you know, at scale, that just wasn't working, no. you know, for our business. So we went to market looking for a solution, you know, a software solution to solve uh, the problem. Rather than build it ourselves, we were growing rapidly and we needed a solution then. So we went to market, looked, looked around. There really wasn't anything that wasn't six figures plus, um, you know, just to implement and then six figures plus for license fees. And they're all US-based solutions, so they actually didn't even integrate properly with eBay Australia. They didn't integrate with any Australian freight carriers. And it, was, it just wasn't going to work for our business. So we had no option but to start to build out you know, that platform for our own business. So can I just ask, at that point, you were saying we. So had you already met your... Um, no, well, no, no, I hadn't actually. So at this stage, um, I guess it's, you know, timelines are a bit blurred yeah. exactly when. Sure. But at this stage, no, I hadn't met Simon. So um, Simon, I actually put out an advert for a, a developer. And I think maybe this was a trigger for putting out that advert mm -hmm. maybe, you know, for a, a software developer in Brisbane to assist me in building the system for our own business. Um, and I'll never forget Simon coming in for the job interview. It would be good if Simon was here today, actually. Um, but, you know, he came and his shoes were like, two sizes too big, he couldn't speak a word of English, um, and he had just finished studying at QUT. And my way out at the time was in Kapalabar, so you know, he was in the middle of nowhere. Um, yeah. you know, and um, it was, I got him to do this ridiculous test, I gave him like a programming test to do overnight, and he came back with this totally over-engineered solution <laughs> um, that was just you know, crazy. Um, and I said, oh, he's brilliant, even though I can't understand a word that he says, um, this guy's a freak. And I don't know how I was that lucky to find him, to be honest. Like a, uh, that was also a local advert in like the Capalabar, oh, right. you know, Times or whatever it's super called. Local. You know, yeah, super local. And he lived in Sunnybank at the time, so I don't even know how he saw the advert or whatever, right? So um, I guess that was a bit of a miracle, to be honest. It was a stroke of luck. Um, and so, yeah, I hired him. And um, my wife at the time, well, not wife at the time, um, she's still my <laughs> wife. Um, <laughs> my, um, my at the time, girlfriend, um, Annette, uh, she was studying speech pathology at QT. So I actually had her take Simon to QT to learn how to speak English and to improve his lisp, which he still actually has today. Um, it's very hard to understand in Chinese or English, but he's a fantastic person and he's really changed my life. So, yeah. Great. Fantastic. So tell us then, so you hired him to build the platform with you for your own business at that point. Yeah. And That's, then how did you go from there to Nito? So I guess what we ended up building was a platform that was not just a platform for our own business to sell through, but it was a platform for other businesses to sell through, that being our own department store. Like any department store, you know, the department store itself doesn't hold all the inventory, right, in the, in the real world um, or the offline world. Um, so we were trying to do the same online, just like Amazon. You know, they have their own inventory and they have inventory fulfilled by third parties. So. We had all these third parties fulfilling you know, for us. We had about 90 suppliers um, at the time. And so these suppliers were using our own software to list on our, on our online department store and to fulfill orders that were placed for their products on our online department store. And ultimately, these, these businesses, they said, hey, can't you build you know, a website like this for my own business, you know, my own wholesale business? Um, and ultimately, they became Nito's first customers. So we weren't Nito at the time, but these were you know, people that I had a really strong relationship with through the business dealings that I had uh, through my own online department store. And ultimately, those relationships led to us building bespoke stores for them. What was your store called? Uh, Big Shop. Okay. Yeah. And a question from the audience here. Do you think there's still opportunities for people wanting to sell things through eBay and oh, definitely. that kind of way? eBay, especially in this country. I mean, to give you some insight into that, um, one of our largest customers on eBay turns over $60 million a year just through the eBay channel, um, wow. not including their own website. So that's pretty considerable. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the top 50 retailers in the country, 25 of those are now on eBay. So that's all retailers. So, you know, the Myers and the so Super Cheap Bordeaux, et cetera. I mean, those guys wouldn't be selling through eBay if it wasn't worthwhile, right? Yeah. Um, the greatest thing about eBay for startups, though, is that it puts you on a level playing field instantly with all those big brands. And it's a great way to leverage the eBay brand to get your own brand out there. I mean, it really costs nothing to list a product on eBay. And if you list a product and, you, you know, you you optimize your listings, there's a really good chance that you will sell it. Back in the day, eBay was very much about price, but that's changed considerably, mm -hmm. so that if you, can, if you can deliver a quality product at the right price, not necessarily the cheapest, um, it, it really does work. So great. Yeah, eBay, definitely a great sales channel. 
So what was the pivotal moment then for you when you changed from being an online retailer to servicing them? Yeah, so I guess we got to a size um, in our own business that we needed to, like any business really does, I guess, um, we needed to take the next step and get investment. Um, it was around the time of uh, the GFC as well, and, and you know, getting that investment was going to be pretty hard, um, and it was also going to be a big risk uh, for our business. And I, f I found myself really not enjoying the retail side of the business. All I was doing was playing with the software all the time. And so yeah. I was hiring people to do all the retail uh, side of the business, and I wasn't really involved in it. I stopped going to China, which I was going to very, very <laughs> regularly at the time. Um, and I got really, really sick on my last trip to China. I uh, got back in got back to Australia like in the nick of time and I had Shigella and that put me out for a couple of weeks and after that I just was like this is not enjoyable and you know at the start it was fun traveling to China and going to these factories yeah. and um, that was great but it, it really started to wear on me and um, yeah like I said the software side was far more interesting and because we had started to do it for some businesses I thought hey you know this might be a bigger opportunity mm -hmm. and um, we got some third-party people and we actually did get some investment for the online store but then, like I say, we got to this point where we needed to seriously look at it, and we did a big analysis of our business, and we looked at, well, you know, what really has value here, and you know, which is the least risky path to take, um, and ultimately, it was the software that was the value we decided. So we took a gamble. We sold the online um, department store as it was, and with the funds we got from that, um, and the relationships we built from that sale, uh, we started to build out the Nido platform. Great. So just on that sale, I suppose, how did that come around? How did you? Uh, we used a broker actually for that, okay. um, and a couple of people came through the door, um, and ultimately, finally, the person that came through the door was someone that's still involved in Nito today. So right. they actually, uh, how the deal uh, ended up being constructed without getting into the finer details that I probably can't, um, it, it ended up being that as part of getting in on the uh, uh, purchasing, you know, the assets of the online department store, um, they would get a, sh a share in, in Nito because I yeah. guess they saw the, the opportunity ben, in, yeah. in that side of the business. Yeah. yeah, great. Okay, and how did you know Nito would work? Was it purely because you'd already kind of started selling it on the side? Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what it was. We had so many people asking us for it that we just couldn't deliver it. And I guess the, the thing that really pushed me over the edge um, you guys might know Catch the Day, they're a very large online department store. Uh, so they knocked on my door and they wanted me to build Catch of the Day, the new Catch of the Day at the time. And it was between myself and IBM WebSphere. And you know, <laughs> IBM WebSphere is a huge platform, you know, millions of dollars to implement. And ultimately, they were desperate for us to do it. Um, and they gave us a budget and it was a significant budget, more money than I'd ever seen in my life. Um, but I didn't have the resources to do it. And I knew that taking it on would just kill us. And so. It was the best decision I've ever made not to take that deal, um, but ultimately it really made me realize, you know, we've really got something here because we were working with them at the time. They were one of these people that were right. seeing, you know, the software. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, it was the best decision I ever, ever made not to, to get involved with that. Um, and great. they've gone on to do great things. And I think if we got involved, they wouldn't have gone on to do great <laughs> things at the time because we didn't have the resources. So it was a win-win. Good, uh, good lesson yeah. in when to say no, I guess. Exactly. It's one yeah. of those moments. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And I guess then, based on what you've just said, you didn't really need funding to start Neat, do? No, we didn't. Yeah. I mean, we had um, we had a bit of capital, um, and yeah, we were able to to, to self fund. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit on what Neto did then? What were you selling then versus, and also update us on what you've got now? Because I know that's evolved. Yeah, massively. Yeah. So um, back then we were a platform for pure play retailers, right? So if you had an online store and you wanted to sell online, you could use you, you could use Nito to do that. But if we're talking about where we're up to in the sort of the timeline, we we're actually selling a lot of promises too. There's a lot of things that we said we had and we didn't have. Um, I, I remember going to our first trade show, which was the first online retail show in Australia uh, in 2009, I think it was. And you know, we had just literally made up the logo a couple of days before we had sort of worked out what the interface would look like and I had done up, done mock-ups, et cetera. Can I just ask, what does Nito, is there a significance around the name? Yeah, well, my wife's name is Annette and I call her Net, and then everyone in Australia puts an O on the end of everything. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually Neto. Yeah. Yeah, so that's actually the truth though. That is, um, there yeah, you go. Okay. basically. And because it was an available domain name, it all just worked, right? Great. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, but at that first trade show, we were literally selling something we didn't yet have. So, you know, we'd done mock-ups. I'd literally done HTML front end, nothing in the back end kind of thing. <laughs> I was saying, yeah, this is how it works. Um, you know, buy it from us now. I'll be ready in six months. Uh, or, or, you know, our lead time is six months. Not that yeah. it will be ready in six months. Implementation time. Yeah. Um, and, and then I still remember going back to next year, and we still hadn't even finished all the stuff that was in the mock-ups that we had done on that first oh, right. trade show. It was quite, quite hilarious, actually. So. Um, yeah, so that was purely though for online retailers, and then so it was helping them just to clarify that, helping them to sell their products online, so an actual s yeah, so to to, to set up an online front. store, the ability to go and set up your own online store, um, to list your products on that online store, and then to fulfil the orders for those uh, products yep. through one centralised back office, which Great. is really what we're all about. So yeah. pick, pack, and dispatch. So print your shipping labels, and then integrate that back down into an accounting system. Great. Uh, at the time, it was only MYB. Mm. Yeah, so that's, I guess, where we started. Um, and that has obviously evolved. So the feature set has built out massively over the last uh, you know, few years. Um, and we've evolved now into an omni-channel platform. So since, and maybe I won't talk about that yet, but since um, the investment we have got over the last couple of years, uh, we've built out Nido Point of Sale, which is a very new product uh, for us. Um, and we built, built out other integrations with other marketplaces, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Okay. To enable, I guess, anyone to sell anything everywhere. Really. So you've had some amazing growth stats that are out there, 100% growth year on year. You've got some great you know, customer numbers now, so 2,000 plus customers, yes. 100 plus staff, a billion in customer sales. Was growth always been kind of your focus from that point no. or how did that happen? Yeah, not at all. I would say our, our numbers in terms of customer count, um, our GMV is really good. So, you know, our customers have turned over, you know, well more than a billion dollars through our platform. But our customer count isn't, I guess, significant in terms of global uh, customer count numbers. Um, for Australia, it's, it, it's fairly good. We are the leading e-commerce platform in our space in terms of GMV, which is how much money our merchants turn, turn over, but definitely not in customer count. Um, when we compare ourselves to the, the, the American you know, platforms that exist. Um, but the reason really for that is because we haven't been focused on growing custom accounts and never have been. It's always been about building the platform. Now, I never felt that the platform's ready to really go global with, and you know, that's really the next evolution in our business. We're getting to that point. You know, I would say November, December this year, we'll be there. Um, but it never has been a focus. We really haven't been a, a sales-focused organization. That needs to change now. Um, you know, we've got a fairly large investor that we're accountable to. Um, so that's a big shift in our mm. business. But up until, up until now, it's been very much about keeping our head above water, you know, so making sure we've got a po positive cash flow. Uh, but it hasn't been about how many customers do we have, how much profit are we making. We so just how did you get that growth? How did that, was it kind of word Organic, of mouth? Or? Yeah, so yeah. because I had no money to market the business and the cost of marketing is obviously very high, until um, you know, we, we got investment, it was very much a word of mouth play, so organic growth. Mm. Um, you know, this industry is, we're pretty tight knit. Um, you know, if I go to a trade show, I know everyone. Um, so we leverage that, really, yep. and we let the product speak for itself. Are there any key pillars or, I suppose, things that you've built the business around? Um, you know, are you particularly focused on any particular areas that you push with your staff and team? Yeah, so definitely people. I guess that's the, the, the number one thing. Um, and for me, our culture is number one. You know, if someone's messing with my culture, they don't have a place at our business. Yep. Um, and I think, I think everyone who works for me or works with Nito knows that. Um, I think we have a really great culture, um, and that's really important to me. So definitely people, people and culture. Mm. Um, and then the product, you know, we, we, we're still very product focused as an organization. Only this month did we put Salesforce in, a CRM. You know, before that we didn't have a proper right. CRM. You know, so we invested this heavily. This month you said? Yeah, so four wow. weeks ago. So we're just... And so you're five years old now, the business? Uh, the, the, yeah, so actually, look, right? as Nito is the SaaS platform, five years old, but yep. really, uh, you know, the first email that Nito ever sent uh, was in 2009. Right. But then we had about two years of just building yep. and then starting selling it as a SaaS selling platform it. in 2011. So five wow. years of selling, yeah. Great. So tell us what's happened over the last kind of 12 to 18 months in regards to, I suppose, getting an investor in and Yeah, so we evolved. got to that point, I guess, again, that every business eventually gets to where we really needed to accelerate our growth and accelerate our development probably more than anything. We couldn't do it organically anymore. And ultimately, we wanted to go global. Um, so we... We, we had a lot of people knocking on our door already, um, internationally specifically. Um, and 
you know, we were fielding all sorts of opportunities from VCs from Silicon Valley, you know, um, and also lo locally. Um, and ultimately, what happened is I was at a trade show, ZeroCon actually, and um, this guy walked up to me uh, from Telstra, and he said, "I'm really interested in investing in Nito." Well, Telstra is very interested in investing in Nito. We've done a lot of research on you. I, want, I came down here to speak to you face to face. I didn't really believe him, but he said, yeah, no, we'll, we'll, be, we'll, we'll see you in your offices in, in two weeks' time. In two weeks' time, he's in our offices, um, and he's extremely serious about acquiring the company. So um, one thing led to another, and so ultimately... So you're actively looking for funding at that point? Yeah, at that point in time, we just started actively yeah. looking. So we were fielding you know, mm -hmm. inquiries. I'd had probably three meetings with three separate VCs. Yep. Um, so it was an opportune time, I guess. Yeah, right. Um, they ultimately, you know, like I said, uh, came up to our office, they put an offer on the table. It was really too good to refuse in comparison to what we were being offered in terms of it was really a joint venture that they were offering us that, that allowed us to maintain um, our independence, which is what I really, really wanted, um, allowed us to run our own ship, but gave us all the resources that we needed to go global. So great. for us, it was a great opportunity. Yeah. Excellent. And so that was last year? Yeah, so that, that, that negotiation started two years ago. Um, you know, being the size that they are, it took about nine months, the, the negotiation process, and the, the due diligence uh, took about four months, I would say. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, we had 45 people working on the due diligence alone um, from their side. So it was in pretty, pretty intense, intense yeah. um, you know, going through every single line of code, um, going through all of our business processes. Um, yeah, it, it was pretty intense. How did, yeah. how did you keep the business kind of going? Yeah, so it was very it was very distracting. Yeah. Um, but I'm very lucky in that I've got a, you know really <laughs> a great COO in Jason who has a lot of corporate experience. I um, mean, he was able to take a lot of that burden, I guess, um, yeah. going through that process. Uh, so 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 yeah, we were able to leverage that. Um, yeah, but it was still a big distraction. Yeah. Um, it did definitely affect our growth for you know about a six month period where all of our focus was really on that. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it, it all worked out, yeah. Yeah, great. And so Telstra now has 51%? Yeah, Telstra has a 51% stake, yep. yeah. Did they require you to have patent on your software or any protection around that? Um, not No patents on our software as such. I mean, obviously protection on trademarks and things like that, yep. um, but no patent on processes or software itself. It's a very hard thing to, to patent. Yeah. So um, we haven't got any international patents or even local patents on the software side, yeah. Were you originally thinking you'd have to sell 51%? What was that, you know, how, what did that number mean to you? Look, I didn't ever want to, you know, sell 51% and, you know, Telstra, you know, is a company that wants to really have full control over any entity mm. that they have acquired, and which means 100% control. And you know, that's I think really what they wanted at, at the start. Yeah. Um, but I was not willing or ready to to give you know mm. that much of our business up. We're still yeah. very much um, early on in our in our life. So, um, you know, 51% was also hard to swallow. Um, but the construct of the deal, um, although they have 51% ownership, um, we maintain control over the day-to-day -day operations. Great. Um, obviously, I was concerned whether or not you know, that would actually play out, um, but it has, and it's been a really great relationship, I must say. Like a lot of people, oh, they think that Telstra would be hard to deal with, um, and I understand you know, why um, from a consumer perspective, but in fact, you know, the people that we deal with within Telstra, which is, I think, what's really important. It's not necessarily about who invests in you, it's the people you work with, yeah. um, and they're just fantastic. So are Telstra investing in a lot of businesses like this? You know, what's their play, I suppose? Yeah, they, they are, the they are. Um, I mean, they have an investments division. Um, we sit under their international new business division, um, which gives us the ability to I guess sit outside of the beast um, and, and be treated as an investment yeah. um, that can go global outside of Telstra's traditional marketplace. Mm. Um, so yeah, they are doing it though. They're doing it in health. Um, yeah. They're doing it in health in a, in a very big way. In fact, um, they have invested in in other businesses like ours as well in, in, in similar industry. Even uh, one of our largest competitors, they have a, a small stake in through the Telstra ventures. So um, Telstra understand that you know fixed line revenue is going down, and they need to you know supplement that with. You know, new technology, yeah. and you probably would have noticed there's been a lot of new advertising 
that's in markets about Telstra becoming a tech company. Um, you know, the Telstra Thrive campaign that's playing out on television at the moment, that's what it's all about. So they're trying to shift uh, the perception of Telstra in the market. Um, they, they want Telstra to be perceived as a tech technology mm. company, not as a telco. Yeah. Um, and I guess we're part of that, you know, yeah. we're being used as, um, I wouldn't say used, that's probably not very nice, but <laughs> we are, um, um, we're used to, we, we're being used to sort of shift the perception of what Telstra is all about yeah. uh, here in this market, yeah. In terms of competitors, can you give us a bit of insight around, you know, what the competitive market's like for you? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a highly competitive market, obviously e-commerce platforms. Um, in, in some respects, but then where we play, which is really an omni-channel platform, allowing someone to sell online, offline, um, you know, through mobile devices and through marketplaces, all from one centralized solution. So is that a bit unique? Is that yeah, that, that, your... that is very unique. So yeah. um, we don't have a lot of competitors in that space. There's really only two or three globally that do it well. Um, we're also just about to launch in the next few months Nido Inventory, which really closes the loop and enables a merchant, whether it's a wholesaler or a retailer, to really manage everything about their business in one platform, except their accounting, which we have native integrations with accounting platforms. And that is 100% uh, unique. So no, no competitor in the space actually offers full-blown inventory as part of their platform. So that all-in-one solution, which is hard to achieve because there's a lot involved in it, um, is very unique. And so we don't have a lot of competition there. Yeah. But the guys we are competing against that rely on add-ons to, to fulfill a lot of what we do ourselves, they're big. You know, they're big VC-backed yep. beasts um, that have hundreds of thousands of customers and operate in 150 plus customers. So it's not easy. We're definitely punching above our weight. Yeah. Um, and we always have. And I think we will continue to do so until we truly go global, which we haven't done yet. We, we're focusing on Australia and New Zealand until uh, about June next year. Yep. Um, and then our next round is all about, you know, taking us global. Yeah, right. We will cover that in a second. So I suppose you are saying that product differentiation is your core competitive it, advantage. It totally is, yeah. yeah. And always has okay. been, yeah. Now, we've talked about how your products evolved. How do you decide, you know, what product area to focus on? You know, is inventory always the obvious one for you, for example, given no one else is doing it, or are there other things that people yeah, are doing that it's, it's quite of... easy for us, having been a retailer um, myself uh, for many years, um, I understood what the pain points are in retail, yep. um, in online retail specifically, and I knew how to solve them. It was, it's always just been a matter of finding the time to develop those solutions. So yeah. um, that got us through until I would say early last year, where you know we built out the capability as I thought it needed to be, and then it, it, it st we started then looking at um, I guess what the market. Mm. really wanted and what was missing in the market. So um, the inventory play, for example, was on the back of a large Telstra research piece that they did um, and also customer feedback. You know, everyone's always asking us, yeah. why don't you do inventory? Why don't you do inventory? You're so close to doing inventory. <laughs> why don't you do inventory? So yeah. yeah, customer demand and a bit of market research to date. That's okay. really, yeah. Can you give the, the audience here some insight into the affordability of your product and who your kind of customers are? Yeah. So I'll platform is extremely affordable when you consider the all-in-one nature of the platform. Um, you can now, you know, use Nito for point of sale for up to 100 products for $9 a month. You know, if you're wanting to run an online store and an on offline store, um, it could be as little as, you know, 150 bucks a month, including the add-ons. Um, and it goes up to, you know, four or $500 when you add all the different modules. Um, so, you know, considering what we do for a business in terms of where the platform people log into at the start of the day and with the platform they log out of at the end of the day, I think we're very cost effective. And those mm -hmm. are monthly fees, of course. And we cover all the maintenance and hosting and security and everything else with those, with those costs, obviously, and support. Um, our customers uh, are, are really, um, I guess, diverse. So we have lots of customers that are mom and pops that, you know, run an online business as a sort of second job. And then we have some really big uh, household brands as customers like Anaconda, Spotlight, um, Edible Blooms. You know, they're not huge, but they've been featured in a lot of Telstra's adverts recently. So you've probably seen them, Wild Earth, uh, Harris Scarf, Dries the Bone. So we've got some, some fairly mm. significant customers as well, which proves that our platform is, I guess, really scalable. Um, Are there any customers really in the room? About. One, two. <laughs> oh, okay. Building my website. Cool. Okay. And I've also got a second business, which is hosting all that through. Yeah. Cool. This, I suppose this audience is right for the uh, side business. So I was just when you mentioned that, I thought perhaps there might be some here. Yeah. <laughs> so Excellent. yeah, I mean, and, and our customer numbers are 
are, are growing substantially at the moment. Obviously, now that we're really marketing the products here in Australia, um, our customer count has doubled in the last year, and our GMV um, the same. So, on average, interestingly, Nito customers um, turn over nine times that of our largest competitor wow. on average per annum, which is pretty exciting Great stat, stat for to us. Be able to yeah. Use. yeah. Um, and, and that's what we really, re, re, really focus on, you know, delivering successful customers. It's not really about how many customers, but, yeah. you know, how successful our customers are. Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah. When you, this is a question that's come in, we've spoken a little bit about how you decide on product features and things like that. How do you kind of measure or get insights from your consumers? Is there any formal ways that you do that, I suppose, as Look, part of your To date, process? we haven't really done a good job at that. Um, we're now at the point where we need to start doing that properly. Mm. Um, so obviously on the front end of our business, you know, we, we use various analytics tools like Kissmetrics and Google Analytics and things like that to measure how people are using, you know, our websites. Um, yeah. We have never really focused a lot on how people actually use our product outside of paid focus groups and some market research uh, that has been done over the years. Um, we, ha we really haven't had the resources all the time to measure how people outside of feedback and you know spending a lot of time with customers yeah. to do it I mean we, we really have been a startup for the last five years and we barely kept our head above water in terms of you know what, what we're trying to do day in and day out um, but we're now at that size which is really cool mm. that we can actually now sit back and invest in some people to focus on you know that, that side of things yeah. so yeah it's exciting times ahead I guess yeah but to date we haven't invested a lot in that great Biggest challenges to date before we kind of look at what's next, I suppose. Any the, stand out? Yeah, I guess um, the biggest challenge is, you know, running our business um, or, and growing our business organically as a startup without any funding. That has always been a challenge. We've always had to punch, you know, well above mm -hmm. our weight. Um, we've always had to tell a few white lies to get big customers. Um, <laughs> and that's been challenging, like everyone does, right? Um, so that's definitely the biggest challenge. I think um, in the last 12 months, the, the, a huge challenge for me personally has been the shift from being you know, a, a real startup to being a serious business and being accountable to someone else, um, you know, an investor. Yeah. Um, so that's been challenging. And then you know, growing from, you know, we were around 40, 50 staff uh, when the investment happened and now we're over 100 staff. So that's a lot of people to bring in on in a short amount of time mm -hmm. and getting that right has been you know, hard and dealing with all the different personalities and, you know, getting some real experience in our business. Um, yeah. You know, that's also been challenging, but at the same time, enlightening. I've learned so much over the last 12 months about best practice and the way you should do things as opposed to the way we thought yeah. we should be doing things. But I wouldn't have changed anything, having said that, especially on the software development side. I think if we followed best practice in software development as a startup, we would never be where we are today. Yeah. Our development has slowed down considerably um, since Telstra came on board. Um, but um, it's for the good. Like in the long term, that's going to be fantastic. But I can tell you now, we would never have, no. um, we would never have been where we are today if we had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what about culture? When you're growing so fast, how do you? And you know, you said how important culture is to you. How do you instill that in your employees? And lots of beer. <laughs> <laughs> we have a beer tap that works really well. This is the truth. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, yeah, so we actually have so a really. So the answer you're expecting, whoever asked that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. So we, yeah, we have a really great, fun culture, and I think it's it stems from the fact that we've got a really young group of people. A lot of our staff, um, you know, Nido's their first job, and a lot of them, you know, was their first job, and they've grown in our business to be leaders of, you know, now, um, you know, some of the teams that they lead are fairly large. So that's definitely helped build the culture, and in, you know letting our customers, or not our customers, our staff know that they do have that ability to move up in the business. That's always been something. Um, I think I've always, and I, I know a lot of people don't agree with this, but I, I have a personal relationship with most of the staff um, in and outside of work, even mm. now as CEO. And I think that really does help in terms of, you know, bonding everyone together and building a great culture. It does make some decisions a little bit harder, um, yes. I have to say. Um, but yeah, I guess just investing in people that share the same values mm -hmm. as us and making sure that when we are hiring people, we do hire people with those same values. I like to say that I wouldn't hire anyone that I didn't think I could go out and have a beer with. Yes. Um, and I know a lot of people say that, but I really do think about that when I have an interview with someone. Mm -hmm. And I think it makes a big difference, to be honest. Um, and you know, a couple of times we haven't done that. It hasn't actually worked out. So, yeah. you know, I stick by that now. Mm -hmm. um, I think also being really open 
um, with people and having an open door policy. You know, that also does create a bit of challenges, especially as we're growing and we add a mid-level, mm. um, you know, management. Um, having people come go around those those n new mm. managers and come straight to me because that's what they've always done. You know, that that can be challenging, but at the same time, it definitely has helped us through this growth phase yeah. um, in terms of you know the cust the staff that we've had since day one, knowing that um, they have access to me. That's been yeah. really really important. Yeah, great. Talk to us about your plans to go global. What are yeah. you thinking? Obviously, that's something that haven't, hasn't happened yet, but it's a big part of what you're planning to do. What's your, your approach going to be? Yeah, so it's something we're actually uh, planning at the moment. So we, we had a, a really uh, important meeting around that today, actually. Um, so when we look at our competitor landscape, um, Australia is only really 5% of the market for our product. Um, and that's where we sort of need to get to. Right now, it's obviously 100. Mm. Um, so we've got a long way to go. <laughs> um, but we're very lucky in, 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 in the sense that we've got Telstra as a partner. So Telstra is um, very well known in the international uh, tel telco um, space. Um, although, you know, we're a small country, um, Telstra does extremely well for the size of country that we are. And they're very well <laughs> respected for that and the technology that they have, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it really puts them in good stead when they step up onto the international stage. So we're looking to leverage a lot of the relationships that they have internationally. So they have relationships with, you know, all the largest telcos in the world, both in Asia and um, the US and the UK. Um, and we've already been approached by a number of those over the last 12 months since the Telstra acquisition, them knowing that Telstra's yeah. got involved with us um, and them wanting to partner with us and resell us in their market. So that'll definitely be one of our strategies will be to leverage the, the relationships that Telstra have built over the mm -hmm. years. We'll also be going direct, so that's how our competitors, you know, go to market in other countries. They they directly interact with customers or, or, mm. or through through partners. Um, so I think we'll have a bit of a hybrid approach, yeah. um, especially in Asia. I think we'll leverage the partnerships that Telstra has built. Mm -hmm. I know from doing business in, in Asia myself that relationships are so important, oh, and it'll yeah. be a lot easier to sell Nito through some of the uh, the partners that Telstra have than going direct. Yeah. But in the US and the UK, I think a direct strategy will work pretty well for us. So is that a new model you have to define then, that partner strategy? It is, and it's something that we're building out at the moment. So we're actually, we, we put a plan in place and we're investing significantly in building out you know, a really strong partner program mm. um, because as it stands today, we don't really have the ability to leverage a partner network yeah. without that program in yeah. place. Um, so that's something we're investing in now. And it's probably something we should have, if I look back, you know, it's the one thing that I think I would have changed is we should have invested in that from day one. Right. Um, we didn't, we should have put partners first. Um, our competitors, you know, about 80% of their business is driven by partners. Right. Um, whereas us, it's 5%. Yeah, it's small. Yeah. And you've got some offices overseas at the moment. So yeah. can you tell us about, I guess, where they are and yeah. how that correlates to where you might go next? Yeah, so um, we have obviously our office in West End, um, where we have the majority of our staff. Um, and then we have an office in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And we have um, an outsourced office in Manila. So Hong Kong is Hong Kong Nito, uh, Nito Hong Kong Limited. So that's our own office. Um, and then the Manila office is actually through an outsourced um, company. Um, the Manila office is purely uh, for front-end web design work, so it's for professional services work that we do. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do a hell of a lot of that work anymore, um, but we push that through. Um, we have a local team and we, we push a lot of the grant work through Manila. Um, in Hong Kong, uh, it's just purely a development team, so we have a scrum team there, five, five developers. Um, Simon actually now, the co-founder, um, he works out of that office, okay. so he moved back to be closer to his parents and grandparents. Um, and because he wanted to move back, we, we sort of set up a bit of a development hub there. Yeah, right. You know, it looks like our office here. It's got the same decorations and, and stuff. Um, and it has the capacity to go to about 12, so we could have probably another okay. one team there. Um, and outside of that, we'll probably leverage Telstra's facilities. And then we have, obviously, the rest of the team here. Yeah. So in terms of global rollout, are you looking to kind of do country, one country at a time or are you going to launch multiple Yeah, ones? definitely. So we're actually going to do a pilot um, this side of next year um, with uh, a company called Maxis Telecom in, in Malaysia um, through a relationship that we have with, with Telstra. So yeah. that'll be uh, our first, I guess, step into a, 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 a true international market. We are already playing in New Zealand and we, you know, we're gonna put a little bit more marketing focus and effort into New Zealand over the next few months. Um, but you know, when we truly go global, I don't really know what that strategy is gonna be quite yet. We're, we're planning that at the moment. Yeah. Um, 
but it definitely will be a country by country approach. Yeah. Um, it's just how we go to market in each country. Mm. Not sure of just yet. Yeah, right. Do you have any tips? There's a question people here who might be thinking about going global. Is there anything you've learned so far that you can share? I think the biggest thing is build a really good, we've learned this already without even going global yet, to build a really great partner network and partner program yep. uh, that others can leverage. You know, even just having a great LMS so people can learn about whatever your product is mm. um, before you jump into a new market, yeah. um, it, it's critical otherwise, uh, yeah, you, yeah. Starting on the back foot. Yeah. At the moment, do most of your customers come to you direct online? Yes, the vast majority of our customers. Yeah. So what role do you see the partner networks as having? Well, within? more than anything, driving leads to our business, right? Yeah. So really... So amongst their customers? And yeah, yeah, yeah. And also delivering services that otherwise we are delivering today. Okay. So a huge number of the setup services, professional services like web design, um, you know, we still deliver ourselves. And right. that's a very big... Look, it, it, it's mm -hmm. a positive differentiator for us from other platforms at the moment, but at scale, it's never going to work. Yes. You know, we can't be designing everyone's web shop, setting everyone up. We need partners to be doing that for us. We do have a number of partners today. I think 200 odd, Alison? Uh, yeah, about 160. 160 mm -hmm. partners. Um, you know, but they don't, they don't deliver us enough business um, because we don't have the tools that they need yeah. to do so. Right. So that, that's what I mean by we've learned that already. We've yeah. got a great network of partners, but they're all going, we need more help, we need more yeah. tools, we need more resources, we need more collateral, we need you know, better le <laughs> learning, everything, everything. Yes. yeah. And we go, oh, we'll, we'll get there, but um, we're not quite there yet. So you mentioned also earlier that you're doing another funding round. Yeah, so I mean, it, I wouldn't say it's a funding round as such. Um, it, it's, you know, we're part of the Telstra um, mm. family now. Um, so yes, it's a, it's a funding round, but it's internal. Okay. Um, you know, it's just more about building a plan mm. to know how much capital we need yep. to take ourselves and is that for to the, the next level. Overseas? Is yeah, that yeah. Primarily? So our focus at the moment in this, you know, this first 24 months um, of this Telstra um, investment has been about rounding out our product, uh, getting our business to be efficient at scale. Yep. Um, you know, moving office, hiring all the staff, all that type of stuff. Yes. Um, and the next round is all about taking what we've now built and proven in this market. You know, to the rest of the world. Yeah. As a, as a company that serves customers direct via the web, um, I'm sure you know a lot of people in the past would have just gone, we're going global, we're available everywhere. Obviously you've taken a much more kind of staged approach with your partners. And where did that kind of come from? And I know when we spoke earlier, you were talking about, this is months ago I should say, we were talking about views on growing too fast. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit to that around you know, that approach? Around growing too fast? Yeah, around how maybe others have grown too fast in your perspective, so you've taken a different approach because of yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So, yeah, they have actually. So some of our competitors, um, you know, they they went global very quickly. They set up offices um, all over the world. Um, and within, you know, two years, they've had to shut down, you know, half of those offices. They've had to scale back their staff by literally half and um, ultimately uh, they're on the brink of disaster. So we definitely don't want to you know, go down yeah. that path. I think uh, we'll definitely be maintaining Australia as our sort of hub. Yep. Um, obviously with Telstra, it's really important that we probably do that as well. We're yes. not looking to go and set up you know, and, and move all of our staff and, and no. uh, facilities offshore. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from what our competitors have done in yeah. trying to do that and grow too quickly. So we definitely don't want to grow too mm. quickly and um, we don't need to. I don't think we have the same pressures as a lot of our competitors have. So a lot of our competitors are funded by VCs and some of them you know, up to 25 different VCs. So right. they're, they're accountable to a lot of different people and they're being pulled in lots of different ways and um, that makes it very hard for them to to grow um, at the rate they want to grow because they've got so many people telling them how to grow, yeah. right? We're very lucky that we've only got one investor mm. um, and we set our own you know, growth Agenda. path. Yeah. Um, and that investor isn't reliant on the revenue that we're generating yes. in no way, shape or form. Yeah. So we can grow at our own pace um, and that's what we, we plan mm. to do. Great. Um, we're not gonna grow too fast, but we definitely need to grow just for the sake of the fact that platforms, commerce platforms are very sticky. And so if we don't grow mm -hmm. quickly, um, at least quickly enough, um, then we're just going to really struggle to acquire customers in the long yes. term because yep. to migrate them from other platforms is a lot harder to get them you know, at the start. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The corporate world often learns a lot from startups. Is there something that you've learned from Telstra? 
Oh, yeah. You can share. Oh, from <laughs> Telstra. Yeah, I mean, I, I've definitely learned that they, we definitely do not want to be part of um, the beast just yet. There's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of red tape, um, and, and they, they know that too. They know that better than anyone. Yeah. You know, they said that from day one. They, they've gone down that path in the past, and they've really struggled. Um, I, I would, yeah, I mean, I guess if I was to step into the corporate world one day, I would, um, I would be careful what I say. Um, <laughs> but right, look, it is I, I th yeah, no, look, I, I, like I said, I'm really happy with the relationship, um, but I can see a lot of um, a lot of problems in a business of that size. I think yeah. there's, there's a, a lot of unnecessary processes. Um, one thing I've learned actually is no matter how big the business is, there's only ever you know really one person that makes the the decision at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, so what I found early on is that we weren't speaking to the right people. Yes. You know we were speaking to people and wheels were just turning, but nothing was ever happening. And eventually, when we worked out who to speak to, it made mm -hmm. all the difference. And yeah. um, I guess advice. that's one thing I've learned is that work out early who to speak to in big organizations and yeah. don't waste your time uh, with anyone below them because yeah. it is really just a waste of time because at the end of the day that one person makes the decisions and often by the time what you've spoken to the first guy you spoke yeah. to about it and gets to the guy you want to speak to the message is all it's mixed up late, anyway. Yeah, yeah so. right. Are there any times where you wanted to give up? Yes. And lots what of, happened? Lots of How times. did you get through them? Yeah. Um, it's funny because you forget about those times yeah. when you're in a position that I'm in now. Um, but often I, you know, often I do think back to them. Yeah. Um, I, I can remember so many times I'd be driving home at night from Capella Bar to my house in Camp Hill at the time at like three in the morning yeah. and just wanting to drive the car off the road, literally, <laughs> yeah. or, or jump off a bridge. Like it, it got that bad at times. Um, but I guess what got me through was the potential. Like I've always seen a huge potential in this business. I mean, this industry is so new <coughs> and there's just so much opportunity. Um, and when I see what businesses today are still doing in terms of manual processes and you know the way they're operating their businesses, even the big guys, even some of our biggest customers, um, I just think that there's so much opportunity. I guess that's, what's, that's what gets me through. If you're starting Nito today, what would you do differently? Not a hell of a lot, to be honest. Um, what, I can tell you things I wouldn't do differently. Yeah. Like I say, I think that one thing I definitely wouldn't do differently, I wouldn't have changed our development processes. So I think, you know, now we've got a lot more stringent processes in place, a lot more testing, a lot more, you know, everything. Um, but if we had those, we definitely wouldn't have got to, mm. to where we've got. Um, you know, I would definitely have taken the same level of risk um, that, that we did take. Yeah. Um, maybe one thing I would have done um, is, like I said earlier, is focused probably more on building documentation and support for third parties that wanted to, to sell or, yeah. or, or, or leverage our platform because ultimately that would have given us really good leverage at a, from a sales perspective yep. and would have allowed us to grow a lot, lot mm. quicker. Yeah, sure. So a few audience questions here before we finish up. What systems do you use internally to manage your business? Um, yeah, cool. So we use a ton of SaaS apps. So we're very much um, for SaaS applications. We use no on-premise software at all, um, which is super important, I think, nowadays. Mm. It, it really does enable us uh, to grow outside of just our own office, for example, very quickly and easily. Um, we use Salesforce, like I said, on the sales side. Um, on the development side, we use um, Atlassian products. So we use Confluence and we use Jira. Um, I'm sure lots of you guys here will be aware of those um, products on the development side. Um, and then for customer service, we currently use Zendesk, um, but we are looking to move all of that to Salesforce in the near future. But, sell, but Zendesk is a fantastic prod product. It's not for any uh, reason other than we're wanting to consolidate all of our uh, customer communication into mm. one you know, central location that we are moving. Um, or potentially moving. Um, on the hosting side, we currently use Rackspace, but we're migrating to AWS um, actually uh, over the next few weeks. Um, so that's been a nine month project, um, which is exciting for us. Um, and then in terms of mail and documents and, and um, you know, general office docs, we use Google Apps. So um, you know, all of our, our slide sharing and um, yeah spreadsheet sharing, et cetera, is typically done through Google Apps. And a lot of our staff do use Microsoft Office products, mm. um, but ultimately anything they create in that is loaded <coughs> into Google Drive at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and then on a, from the analytics side of things, we use um, KISS metrics, we use Google Analytics, um, we use various um, other you know, marketing tools like Crazy Egg for you know, tracking, yep, uh, tracking staff on uh, customers on sites and things like yeah. that. But, um, okay. and, and, and another really great one is Intercom. Sorry. Intercom is okay. probably, has anyone heard of Intercom here? Um, yeah. So if you have an application, or even a website, really, Intercom can be a really fantastic tool. Um, it sort of replaces live chat, I guess. I find it to be more, much more effective than live chat, and um, you know, it's a really fast-growing startup. Um, I wouldn't say they're startup anymore. They've raised, um, I think, many hundreds of millions now. Right. Okay. Um, but it's a fantastic tool. Yeah. Excellent. Is there a principle in business and life that you try and live by? Yeah. Um, never say, never take no for an answer. Something definitely. Um, that that I sort of live by, and always you know always have, yep. um, and just have fun, you know. Excellent. Um, don't get caught up in the red tape. Is there? What is your least favorite part of your job now? Um, actually, I don't, yeah, you can't say fishing, I don't really have <laughs> a least favorite really? part. I, I, I've wow. been lucky that I'm able to push that horrible stuff onto other people Great. now, actually. <laughs> Um, so I actually have a pretty good. Um, <laughs> maybe the, maybe the, the least favorite part of, of my job is just dealing with some of the office politics as you get bigger. Yeah. You know, that's probably the least, the least favorite part of my job. And, and also trying to, you know, we, we, like any business, you know, we've got a budget that we need to stick to. And, um, you know, one of the, the things I really struggle with is we have some exceptional people in our business. Um, and, you know, we're, we're you know, we're relatively, m relatively small still, um, and there's you know really global opportunities for some of our exceptional staff, and um, you know, trying to, I wouldn't say it's, yeah, trying to keep the really good staff. I wouldn't say it's the least mm. favorite part of my job, but it's a tough thing to do sometimes. You know, you have your annual review with some of your best staff, and you know you can see their ambition, they're wanting to go places, and we. We, we can't always compete with some of the global players, yeah, right. so that's that's a hard that's a hard thing to do. Yeah. Um, you know, keep. Yeah, keep, keep you good people. You're really good people. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Uh, question here: Is there a potential for Nito to be the source of interesting data insights, looking at the timing of transactions across industries or other? Aspects? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's you know that's a really really important thing for us moving forward. And actually, there's a whole division in Telstra that's going to be you know focusing on on that in years to come, and you know the data that's going through our platform. We're already starting starting to use it. Um, you know, we've partnered with various payment uh, providers and shipping carriers in recent months, um, and so we've started to look at that data a lot, a lot mm. more closely. Um, but yeah, I mean, the data that's going through our platform at the moment is ex is really, really valuable. Um, we don't look to monetize that at the moment. Yeah. Um, but but obviously, in the long term, that's definitely going to be a really an opportunity. important opportunity that yeah. we're going to focus on yeah, for great. sure. Yeah. Okay, two final questions. What does a day in the life of look for you? Uh, okay, um, what the whole day from start to finish? <laughs> Summarised. Let's summarise it into key chunks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. No. So, like I said, I've I'm really good. Um, so, I um, I look after as CEO. I look after. Um, we've Jason was my CEO. He looks after the marketing, the sales the finance and the HR side of things. And I very much focus on customer service and, and product. Mm -hmm. um, so my day starts with attending all the stand-ups of the various product teams. So we have three scrum teams in the Brisbane office. Um, and I attend the stand-ups of those just to get across exactly what you know everyone's working on. Yep. And if everyone understands Agile or Scrum, um, they'll understand what that means. Um, I then get have a catch up with our, our lead of customer service to get an idea of what where they're up to in their day, um, and then I, I sort of I don't even I don't have an office anymore. I do have an office, but I never sit in my office anymore. <laughs> so I sort of stand at a stand up desk and I literally just take questions from people all day. Um, and then when I see something going wrong, I run over to the area and I scream and shout and get angry. Put out the fire. <laughs> um, and get in trouble for doing that. Um, yeah, so that's really what I do. I try to just I'd be available to true? everyone to ask questions. I don't see someone screaming to show teams. Yeah, you get involved. You get involved, yeah. I try to put our fires. Yeah. I'm trying to share the knowledge, I guess. Um, the idea is at the moment, um, there's, you know, 50 plus new people in our business mm -hmm. um, that don't know a hell of a lot of our platform or our customers. So 
I do. Um, and there's not many of us that do to the same extent that I yeah. do. So I'm just trying to make myself, I guess, at the moment available yeah. uh, for those people to ask questions. And I'm also trying to drive and, and finish off a number of uh, product related product projects that we're working on. So we've got a brand new product manager. So, you know, ultimately she's learning a hell of a lot mm. at the moment. Um, yeah, so I guess that's my day. And okay. then at the end of the day, I go home and I drink beer. <laughs> Sounds good. I start drinking beer at work and then I go home and drink <laughs> more beer. Seeing the, you know, importance of beer in this. Do you have a piece of advice that you would give first time startups here today? Yeah, um, I would definitely, the, the one thing I would say, and I say this to a lot of uh, people that I meet, startups that I meet, is to try and leverage uh, leverage the big guys. So we, we did very well by leveraging a relationship that we had with eBay, for example, and Australia Post. Um, don't be scared, I guess, by those types of organizations either and how big they are. Again, it's about knowing or, or meeting or um, getting to know the right person in those businesses and they can really accelerate your growth. So for eBay, for example, um, and this is you know where the white lies come to play, um, but you know with eBay, we, we formed a very early relationship with them. Um, you know, I got very friendly with very important people at eBay and ultimately we were able to leverage that relationship and you know, they were, uh, they've been a really great source of customers for us. They've, they've even funded um, parts of our platform. So yeah, I would say build relationships with um, you know, businesses that you can leverage yeah. to grow your own business, especially if right. you don't have funding like I didn't have funding, right? So that was a really great way to organically grow our business and yes. um, leverage the customers that they already had. Mm, for sure. Well, thank you very much for being involved. Please join me and uh, stand up and show a round of applause. Yes. Thank you. Cheers. Small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Cheers.